Wendy Morton, between the 6th of September and the 25th of October, you were Chief Whip. Your job lasted as long as Liz Truss's premiership. 40, 40 odd days. Must have been a hell of a roller coaster. The toughest point. Being Chief Whip, I guess, is always tough. Um, it's probably tough mid-term for any chief whip. Um, so there was a number of things that happened along the way. Sadly, we had the death of the Queen very early on, which meant the reshuffle had to pause, rightly so, for the period of mourning. Then we came back, continued with the reshuffle. There was party conference. There was the benefit rise debate. There was yeah. the tax issue. Um, the night of the... Um, it wasn't about a fracking vote, actually. It was about a confidence in the government and taking out of, over the order paper. Um, so there was a number of things that, that happened. But you know what, Gloria? I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. Um, I just feel deeply honoured and privileged to have had that position for the short time that I that I did. And, and you know, um, Liz, Liz did some good stuff in that short period of time. It's very easy to say what went wrong, but actually the work she did around energy prices and she knew some tough decisions had to be had to be made. So, yeah, as many chief whips, I've probably got a few scars on my back. But that that is politics. Was there a moment when you realised? that Liz Truss's premiership was unravelling and it was not recoverable? Um, a lot of people ask me that question. And I think from the beginning, it was tough. Um, I think party conference was always going to be tough, but actually she got through that really well. Um, by the time we got to that, the night of everyone just calls it the fracking vote, it was obvious that things were very, very difficult. Um, but... You know, I don't think it was just that. I think there was the budget that had been difficult. It was a it was a whole host of whole host of things. Um, so it just became increasingly increasingly difficult, and you just had that feeling that you know it was probably going to last short term, not 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 long term. I read um, an article. I'm sure you've read this too. It was in the Mail on Sunday. It was a few days after you and Liz Truss were no longer in your jobs. The headline was this, I just don't want her in here, I hate her. Those were the attributed, mm. off the record mm. quotes from Liz Truss's aides revealing her dislike about you. What was your reaction when you read that story? I was quite staggered when I read that. Um, I've probably been in politics to know that you don't always believe everything that you read, but it is still quite hurtful. That said, um, look, I do get on with Liz and actually I, I bumped into her last night in the Commons. We've had coffee together. I think it was a very, very tense period. But it's fair to say the relationship between number 10 in general and me, or number 12 as it was, 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 was difficult at times. And I think that reflects you know, the nature of politics and everything that was going, going, going on. But, you know, when you get told that people call you Wendy Moron rather than Wendy Morton and, 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 and other phrases, and I heard that direct from colleagues who were, were saying that's what um, they've heard me called. Um, from number 10. They didn't say where it was from. Um, and there was other things that, you know, sometimes we all make the mistake of reading Twitter, don't we? And some of the comments on, on there. Um, but you have to get on with the job and that's what I would always try to do. Horrible being called Wendy Moron, though, by people, not not sort of from your opposition, the opposition yeah, parties, it, because yeah, that's and, part of the cause and sometimes, it, and sometimes it's the people that are closest to you that I think feel it the worst, isn't it? You know, it's 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 family and it's just, you know, when you, when you have to say, right, um, Dad, don't put the TV on, I'm in the news a bit. Um, that's, that's the thing that sometimes I think is, yes, it's part and part of politics, we all have to take it, but the question is how much of it is acceptable and how much of it is not. Did, did it cross a line, the sort of I just, the language that was directed at, at, at you during the I, tenure? I, I think having been an MP, having been a councillor, having been in politics, you just, you get used to it, but it's not right. And and does it cross a line? Sometimes it probably does. Um, I mean, whilst I can't talk about the, the, the other story, the text from a certain MP, I mean, some of that was particularly vile, that sort of language. Um, but, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we should be in a position where this is about having respect for one another, even in a political environment. You've been an MP, Gloria. You, you go into the chamber, there are some very, very heated debates, but you should be able to walk out of that chamber and be able to have respect for one another. 
And let's just explain um, what you just referred to then. About a week into the job, you were the recipient of alleged abusive texts from uh, the Member of Parliament, Sir Gavin Williamson, over his exclusion from the guest list of the Queen's funeral. Uh, during a further text exchange about a month later, you wrote, I need no lecture from you, Gavin, when I ask a civil question. There are investigations going on. Do you have any idea about when they will conclude? Um, no, obviously, because there's an investigation ongoing, I, I can't comment. I would just hope that the investigation follows the due process and hopefully sooner rather than later we get a, we get a conclusion. Are difficult and unpleasant conversations like that, was that part of, 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 of the job? It shouldn't be part of the job, but, but was that more commonplace than that isolated incident that we, we, we know about? Being, being Chief Whip is a tough job. Being Chief Whip, you, um, you are responsible for getting the votes through Parliament. And I have to say, I didn't lose a single vote when I was Chief Whip. There are probably few Chief Whips who can say that. Um, but there's much more to it than that. There is party discipline. There are difficult conversations that have to be had. And, and yes, sometimes people do get angry in the heat of the moment we probably we probably all do but I still come back to the point that you know there are in my view there are certain red lines um, and you know you have to be able to at the end of the day still get on with get on with people I think the bit about being chief whip that people don't recognize is that alongside the you know the tr traditional part of discipline is there is also a pastoral side to it there's a welfare side to it that is equally important and what I would say about the team that I had, I worked with a brilliant team for those 40, 40 odd days and I couldn't have asked any more of them. You withdrew uh, the whip from the Conservative MP, Connor Burns. Um, he had it restored after being cleared of serious misconduct at the party conference in October. Did you act too quickly on that? Look, that was a, a decision that, yes, I, I made. Connor is back now. The investigation is concluded. So um, I think it's important that we all, we all move, move on. So I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to be drawn any more on that. And I don't think that's fair on anyone. OK. So you're married to Dave. And politicians' partners often see the reality of any upset, strain, stress when you get home, when you're behind closed doors with your, your loved ones. What sort of support did Dave provide to you during that? Maybe it was just having a glass of wine together or... Um, he's, he's very pragmatic. Um, he's, I'm going to say, very down to earth, feet on the ground sort of a person. Um, and um, I think even on the night of the fracking vote, um, a friend, a colleague actually rang and said, do you realise what, what's happening? And, um, and he said, well, Wendy will do whatever she wants. He knows that I will just get on and do with it, do what I need to do in the work that, that I do. You know, um, and, and I think that's, it's something, there is something about, yes, the support that you have is really important. It's about being able to pick up the phone and talk. Um, but equally, you do need someone at home who is, realistic and who actually can keep your feet on the ground. The thing about politics is um, what I've learned in the what seven years that I've been um, a, an MP, for a number of those I've been a minister, but uh, my husband will always say to me, but Wendy, you won't be a minister forever. Everything always comes to an end at some point. And I think it's important that we always remember that. And I think that's why for me being a constituency MP as well is a good way of keeping your feet on the ground because the people back home will tell you what they think. And of late, I've been really touched by the huge amount of support that I've had from a lot of them. Are there things that could be done to improve the culture in Parliament? Every MP will tell you that there's, there's, there's a toxic, there can be a toxic mm. atmosphere. There can be poison, normally from your own side, <laughs> uh, rather than uh, the, your political opponents. Is there anything we can do to, to clean it up, to make it a nicer place? I think it will always be a challenging place, but I think we have to we have to make it a better place. We have to find a way of raising standards, raising expectations. I think um, Parliament has come a long way, even in the time that I've been a candidate. So I first stood in 05 and then 10, it wasn't successful until 15. And I've seen the diversity of Parliament change, and that is a really good thing. Um, 
but I'm not always sure that the processes and the structures and the systems in place in Parliament have come at the same speed. Um, and I think about, back to some of the debates that we've had to have in Parliament for changes um, into the way that we work. It's not that long ago Parliament used to sit all night yeah. before our time. Um, you know, things around um, maternity leave and paternity leave, those are things that have actually come relatively late to Parliament. So I think it's about working practices. But for me, it also fundamentally comes down to the fact that, um, you know, Parliament is, is at its best when we, ha we can spar in the chamber, have have debates but respect has to be there um, that's respect not just of colleagues but it's also about staff as well um, and I know the speaker um, Lindsay Hoyle has got what he calls a conference that they're looking at some issues around uh, relationships between uh, uh, working relationship between staff and, 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 and MPs I think that's important but I think it's something that we just really need to um, be mindful of um, and I think now for new MPs coming in, I think it's all, I think it's becoming increasingly important that we all understand what we're coming into. I think social media has changed politics. Um, there are more threats out there than, than, bef than before. Um, and so I think it's, in it's important that we all recognise recognize that. I don't think there's a magic key to all of this. And I think leadership always comes from, um, from the figures at the top of any organisation. But it's important that we... Uh, look, the, 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 our parliament is described as the mother of all parliaments. Our democracy, our democratic system is looked up to around the world. So I think, therefore, we should, we should always endeavour to uphold the highest standards. How do you make colleagues be kinder to one another? It's not just about being kinder, it's about, it's about being respect. It's about having respect. And I think uh, we're, all, we're all responsible for our own, our own, our own behaviour. Um, you can't change the world, Gloria, but I think someone once said to me, um, just be yourself. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but treat people in the way that you would expect to be treated. As a former Chief Whip, do you get why MPs rebel? Because you could say that the discipline over, I think, well, over a number of years, actually, in your party has been difficult to instill. I mean, at the moment, whether it's house building, dealing with uh, illegal immigration, fracking, wind farms, you know, the, the list goes on. Why do you think it's hard to get discipline in your party? I think it can be hard in any political party to get discipline. Um, look, our party is at its best when it's a broad church. And, and we had a, an amazing election result in 2019 that really demonstrated the breadth of support that we have. Sometimes in politics, you have to, if you're a minister uh, or a chief whip, you have to guide that ship through the waters and make sure you bring colleagues with you. Sometimes people will rebel um, because they're not happy with a particular policy. And I'm, I must admit, I've signed a couple of amendments of late, one around housing, um, because it impacted so so um, strongly on my constituency, and it's an issue that I've campaigned for for a long time. It would take an awful lot to vote against the government. I've never voted against the government. Um, um, but sometimes by... Signing a, a rebel amendment, you can get you can influence government policy. You can then talk to ministers. Um, and actually, this week, I genuinely believe that the amendments that went down against the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill have meant that the the, the bill has come out of the, its phase in the Commons in a much better place okay. um, as a result of of the input of colleagues. Final question: Is there anything during your short tenure as Chief Whip? that you wish you'd have done differently? Gosh, look, we can all, re all reflect, and my goodness, I've reflected on a lot of the, over what happened over those, those days. And I don't think there's one big, one main thing that I would have done differently. Um, you know, I, I think you, you can sit here and you can reflect and think, oh, I should have done this, should have done that. But actually, you've got to move on because moving on is about doing the best for my constituents, doing the best for our party and doing the best for, 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 the, for the country. Did you shed a tear? when you? No, I didn't actually. Okay. I didn't shed a tear. Um, it, was, it was a strange feeling. It was, I was sad. Um, I was probably a bit angry. But in a way, I was relieved. And the biggest difference was I had a free weekend afterwards. <laughs> Wendy Morton, 
Um, I feel like we've lifted the bonnet on some of uh, the ways our, our politics uh, works in that very turbulent period in your party when you were Chief Whip. Thank you. Thank you.